Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Professor Patrick Locke Ocheno Lumumba is in Nigeria as a keynote speaker of the 2019 LX lecture with the theme Strong Men versus Strong Institutions. And Arise News crew is now standing by to take him up on a variety of issues affecting the continent, including the very topic of his mission uh, to Nigeria. Well, we'll be joining our crew, uh, you know, um, on the ground with uh, Professor Lumumba in a matter of, uh, of minutes. But this is a very interesting topic, strong men versus strong institutions. I mean, which is the best, you know, for us to deepen our democracy in you Africa? You know what I'm going to say, strong institutions. <laughs> that, it's taken from a quote by Barack Obama when mm. he came to Ghana, that trip where he famously snubbed Nigeria, which mm -hmm. we still haven't forgiven him yeah. for. So he gave his prescription for democracy in Africa and talked about placing emphasis on strong institutions over strong men. And we are seeing that been tested in the United States of America right now. If you don't have strong institutions, a strong man leader will test the limits of democracy and sometimes overreach the limits of democracy. So absolutely strong institutions. Well, Definitely Nina. strong institutions. I mean, I think the entire notion as well of strong men versus strong institutions also looks very deeply into the grassroots of patriarchy that is so infiltrated in, Ni in countries like Nigeria and other developing countries socioeconomically and politically. We always push the notion of strong men, strong men, strong men. But where has that notion ever gotten us? It's only ever gotten us to weak institutions. So, well, hey, that, look at Rwanda. 60% well, of their parliament is female and they are Africa's most developing economy. Well, let me prob problematize it. I mean, it's very convenient uh, to rely on Western prescriptions, you know, uh, either the Western model of democracy or what is prescribed by Western intellectuals, and then easily just say strong institutions. But if you look at many African countries, the mentality of our people, the peculiarity of our democratic process, it would seem to me that, you know, many Africans would like to see both strong men and also strong institutions. Look at Nigeria in the last election. One of the reasons, you know, uh, a lot of people voted for uh, General uh, Mohamed Buhari as he then was in 2015 was because they felt that, oh, this is a strong man. And it is also partly, in my view, the reason why the military still has a very strong hold, you know, uh, on uh, Nigerian politics. And if you look at some other countries, take Rwanda. Yes, there are strong institutions that have been put in place, but how you describe, you know, uh, the president of uh, Rwanda? He will easily That's qualify right. as a strong man mm -hmm. in uh, African politics. A strong man. If you go to Tanzania, you know, Tanzania, Magufuli, uh, yes, came. He said he was going to, you know, fight corruption, you know, uh, develop institutions and all that. But he practically ended up as a bully, you know, or what we call, you know, a strong man. So, I mean, would it not be better for us to have a combination of both? Because Africans, you know, uh, who seem to like to uh, like a strong character that they can look up to. Strong man in this case does not mean necessarily mean dictator. But it does, Dr. Abati. <laughs> absolute power corrupts absolutely. There is no, yeah. you know, middle ground. Nobody wants feebleness in leadership, obviously. But we need institutions to be able to check strong men. We we want a strong leader, but he has to have checks and balances. Otherwise, people do run rampant. We do. And I yeah. think uh, mentalities are not static. They're dynamic. They can be changed. Our mentality is as it is today because of our military misadventure. So that can be changed in time. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, but the thing again is when we have strong institutions, those strong institutions have to be properly organized uh, because we, have, we don't have a shortage of institutions in Africa. You know, yeah, people like to set up things. They like to, you know, bandy words around. But what is the quality of those institutions. This is the thing. Hmm. Well, um, let's now join uh, Rufai Hosseini, who is on the ground with uh, past, uh, Professor Patrick uh, Lumumba. Rufai, good morning. All right, um, it's a joy and it's a pleasure being here today, and I'm really excited to be here at the ALEX event. and. Uh, we're going to be talking about strong institutions and strong men today. Uh, Professor Patrick Lokotieno Lumumba is here uh, to speak at the ALEX 2019 lecture. In fact, uh, ALEX, a, a top legal firm, is celebrating their 15 years, and uh, they brought no other person than uh, Professor 
uh, Loko Tieno Lumumba, former director of Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission and the, the Kenya School of Law, uh, alongside other great speakers like uh, former CJN of Nigeria, Jose Saluma Mukta, to speak to us. But I've got uh, the great man here himself here. I met you last uh, many, many, many years ago at Heathrow. You, s you go around and you preach this message of inspiration and Africa unbundling itself from the shackles that brought the likes of Pickley Sekasama back of the, of, of the ANC, uh, which has strong institutions. You just want to talk in the line of that, Professor? You need strong men or strong institutions. My view is, is that history has demonstrated times without number uh, that institutions survive men, but men create institutions so that there is a symbiotic relationship between institutions. interrogate in many ways. It is true to say is that when we talk about democracy, particularly in Africa today, we are likely to define democracy as handed down to us by colonizers. But the question is, do Africans have a democracy that is unique to their circumstances? In other words, are African countries and institutions capable of defining what democracy means? And if they are, what is that definition? And once we have defined democracy in a manner that is unique to the circumstances of Africa, what are the institutions that existed in Africa which can be strengthened so that we have a democracy with an African flavor? Thirdly, when we talk about strong men, what do we mean? Do we mean people who act or operate outside of institutions? or people who are working within institutions and they are executing their duties with firmness and excellence. These are the issues that are on the table. I remember in one of your speeches, uh, precisely about well, two, three years back at the Makariri University, where you talked about the homecoming of Africa, Africa taking its rightful place, uh, where you give credence to great African leaders and what they have done and how you celebrated uh, the likes of Nelson Mandela. And at that point in time, you celebrated a man called Magufuli. Mm -hmm. But difference is the case now, mm -hmm. because talking about strong institutions, it is obvious uh, that the president of uh, uh, Mr. Magufuli, the, the president of Tanzania, has started breaking across the line, like you say, as African leaders will do with institutions. What's your take on that? And how can we bring people back to understand that the cornerstone of government is institutions. I think I was speaking at the Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere Memorial Lecture at the yeah. University of Dar es Salaam. And President Magufuli had just been elected to be the president of Tanzania. And what I said was that he was executing his duty with zeal and zest. And that that zeal and zest was necessary at that time in the history of Tanzania. But the truth be told, he was acting within existing institutions. He was not acting outside of the Constitution. He was not acting outside of the prescriptions of the governing party, Chama Chama Pinduzi in Tanzania. Of course, when you come in with zeal and zest and you want to repair certain damages that had been inflicted, there is a tendency for people to interpret that as constituting dictatorship. But we must understand that when you inherit institutions that have been weakened over time, institutions that have been compromised, institutions that have been abused, particularly in relationship with other powers outside of Africa, and you want to repair those relationships, you want to restore order, then you ruffle a few feathers, and sooner rather than later, Western institutions begin to label you. And that is what we are beginning to see in Tanzania when, for example, President Magufuli and his government said that certain Western mining companies were not paying taxes and that they had to pay taxes. Then he annoyed a number of individuals. But the question that we don't ask ourselves, is he right? Was he right? And the answer is, he was. That is also true when people talk about President Paul Kagame of Rwanda. When people say that President Kagame is authoritarian, 
We've got to understand how he is conducting the affairs of the nation within the constitution, within institution, in the context of the circumstances of Rwanda. This is a country that had genocide in 1994. You have a population that is out there that is resentful of his government, a population out there that would want to remove him from power, and therefore there is a sense in which he must respond to those realities. Of course, a few mistakes will be made. And if they are made, then they are dealt with in accordance with the law and on the basis of the institution that are in existence. And it is in that context that we must understand African countries. But there is another thing that we must talk about in Africa. You are typical African country as we know it today is an artificial country created by the colonial powers. And therefore, you find, for example, here in Nigeria, you have a country that was created by the colonial powers. If you look at the nation that are found within the country we call Nigeria, they are nations that existed under their own governing uh, circumstances and their own governing structures. If you go to the Tiv or to the Yoruba or to the Hausa or to the Fulani or to the Igbo or to the Ibibio or to the Ijo, they had their own systems of governance. Then suddenly they find themselves within a geographical space called Nigeria. How do you govern such a nation? And compare and contrast Nigeria with Norway, which is a nation state, or with Sweden, or with Finland, mm. or with the Netherlands, mm. or with Russia. And then you realize that African nations are unique in the manner in which they were constructed and the colonial powers constructed African nations with the sole aim of creating division and tension for the purpose of maximum exploitation. In fact, I think the colonial project was designed in such a manner that if African countries regained their independence, then those countries would not succeed. But in the face and in the midst of many difficulties, there is a sense in which the African nations have been very resolute in trying to retain those boundaries as was agreed in 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and in Cairo under the doctrine of the inviolability of the post-colonial boundaries. Uh, Professor, I, I just want to take you mm. on this real quickly. Mm -hmm. I want you to juxtapose this conversation of strong institutions mm -hmm. with the current realities in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We just had elections. The EU, Electoral Monitoring Body, another institution, had some very, very severe recommendations about our elections. And I also want you to look at that vis-a-vis -vis the role of INEC that organized our elections. A lot of people are saying the institution doesn't stand firm, it doesn't stand tall. Also relate that to what happened in your own country, where there was an ombuds, where the court said the president should go. And there were constant conversations. A lot of people would say the judiciary stood tall these are examples of institution. Why can't we have a linear outplay of the solidarity of institutions in Africa? First of all, let me say something that is potentially very contentious, that African countries don't handle elections well. Number two, African politicians of different persuasions go into the election on the basis that if they don't win, elections have been rigged. So that we have an a situation where contestants are competing in a process where they only expect one result. And we have seen in quite a number of African countries in the recent past, after election, there, is, there are problems. We saw that in Kenya. We saw that in, uh, we are seeing that as I speak in Malawi. We see that in Nigeria. We saw that in Gabon. We have seen that in Togo. We have seen that in Cote d'Ivoire. So that if you are to count African countries, what you discover is that we dispute elections. The other weakness that we have as African countries is the belief that whatever we do in the electoral process must be certified by outsiders. So when the European Union says that African, that we have held elections and they have been held well, then we celebrate. It is a hallmark of our inferiority complex, the belief that we must be approved by outsiders, particularly the erstwhile colonizers. 
Now, the other thing that we must remember is that elections cannot be 100% perfect. And that is why, therefore, we have institutions that we have deliberately created for the purpose of ensuring that when results have been subjected to scrutiny and they are found to be wanting, they will be subjected to a judicial process. And if that judicial process finds that the elections are short of the prescriptions of the Constitution and the law, then they'll make such orders as are appropriate for purposes of ensuring that elections are repeated if necessary. It does not mean that the judiciary is right. It simply means that upon application of the law, the judges are of the considered view that the threshold prescribed was not realized. In Kenya, we saw that, and I was one of the lawyers in the case, in that particular case, and I hold, I hold the personal view that the majority view was not correct. I believe that the threshold of nullifying the, the election was not reached. But we celebrate it because no other African court had nullified an election of an, or an incumbent president. Therefore, we celebrate without examining the merits. The people I listened to, and I asked them, have you read the judgment? They have never read the judgment. They just read sound bites, uh, they listen to sound bites, and then they look at uh, newspaper headlines and they say, this is a good judgment. And they haven't read it at all, which is very sad. Here in Nigeria, I know the matter is sub mm. The question of the election of President Buhari is still under examination. Mm. And I hold and believe that the judges will arrive at a decision that is informed by the law. And it is expected that when they arrive at such a decision, all parties will accept it, even if they don't agree with the decision. That is what institutions are about. Mm. That is why we say that we have an executive arm. We say we have a judicial arm. We have a legislative arm. And we must also accept that even these arms of government are alien to Africa. They are not institutions that were created by us. Mm. These are institutions that we inherited from the colonizers. And many are beginning now to interrogate whether we do not have systems of government that can be uniquely African, where we can resolve disputes in a manner that is unique to our circumstances and in a manner that is acceptable to the majority of us. Mm. Still speaking about institutions mm. and the dynamics of government, uh, Julius Walemo in Ireland, mm -hmm. that you admire so much, at quipping at a foreign institution, the International Monetary Fund, what's called the International Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. We still run to these institutions when we're in dire need, when we need money. They still run the years in Africa. How do we unbundle ourselves from this mindset of coloniality? Because they still run the streets of Africa. Nigeria had its fair share in the 80s with structural adjustment program. How do we unbundle ourselves from all of this? When you are weak, you cannot determine what is in your best interest. Somebody else does. African countries are weak politically. African countries are weak economically. African countries do not, do not speak with one voice, and therefore they are susceptible to manipulation. Many African countries still pander to their erstwhile colonial powers so that those who are colonized by the United Kingdom look to London. Those who are colonized by the French look to Paris. Those who are colonized by the Belgians look to Brussels. And those who are colonized by the Portuguese look to Lisbon. Until the day that we liberate ourselves from that, we will not realize our potential. And that is how I understood Kwame Nukuruma in 1963, when with a sense of passion and urgency, he told those who were assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that beyond the colonial project, there is a neo-colonial project. And the neo-colonial project is designed to operate in a subterranean and in a subtle manner to ensure that the colonizer still is the puppeteer and the countries that were colonized are merely puppets to be controlled. And it is in that sense that you must understand some of these institutions which still exist for purposes of determining how we run our affairs. Look at uh, uh, quite a number of former French colonies in, in, in West Africa with the CFA franc. Uh, which is based on, initially it was based on the French franc, and now it is based on the 
It is based on the euro. Mm. How can we have such a situation where you have central banks which don't control your own currency? It is. It's, it gladdens me that only a few days that the leaders of ECOWAS have now resolved that by the year 2020, I think thereabout, they'll have a currency in West Africa called the ECO. That is the beginning of economic liberation. And such economic liberation is critical to giving countries the power to determine their own future. We can see in Asia, for example, countries like China, which are emerging, they are emerging because they recognize that you must determine your own future. China is emerging. Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Brazil in Latin America, and even Chile are beginning to, uh, are beginning to liberate themselves from the shackles of the neocolonial project. And we too, as a continent, must begin to do so. I hope, therefore, that under Africa Agenda 2063, one of the things we are going to do is to ensure that we are economically liberated. And once we liberate ourselves economically, we'll also liberate ourselves politically. And once we liberate ourselves politically, we'll be able to determine our future. And once we determine our future, we'll be respected. There are many similarities between Nigeria and Kenya and we're talking about institutions. Let's look at the institution of the Senate, mm -hmm. for instance. The institution of the Senate, the Nigerian Senate, there's been a crying song about how much they earn. They pretty much fix the salaries at the expense of a lot of people suffering in this country. The same is the case in Kenya. I want to talk about institutional scrutiny. We have three arms of government, the executive, judiciary, and the legislative. Who watches who? Who scrutinizes who? In the case of Kenya and in the case of Nigeria, where the Senate is earning way more at the expense of the teeny populace of this country. Does this institution not colonize the national parts of this country? You know, the, one of the most tragic things in a number of African countries, including Kenya and uh, Nigeria is that the shortest avenue to quick wealth is politics. You become a politician, then you have access to resources. Some obvious, some not so obvious. And some of the salaries that are earned by politicians in Africa are simply immoral. You look at somebody earning $10,000 or $15,000 a month in a country where the median salary is $1,000 a month. It is immoral. But they don't see it because their conscience is dead. That is the problem with the typical African politician. They have no conscience. They have no concern for the population. And they use the institution that they preside over for personal and private benefit and not for the benefit of the population. And it is tragic. If you look at what happened, for example, in countries in the Scandinavia, I was looking at uh, the Prime Minister of Denmark having tendered his uh, list to the Queen. He was walking and going on public transportation. The movement of an African member of parliament, on the other hand, or of an African uh, uh, minister, is a drama itself, complete with convoys, some, in some countries complete with ambulances and other things. And this is tragic, and I think it is, is moral poverty. I look forward to the day that these institutions will stand for nothing. In Kenya, when we enacted the constitution in the year 2010, one of the things that we said in the constitution is that parliamentarians will not set their salaries, and that there would be an independent... Uh, body called the Salary Review Commission that will be responsible for this. Unfortunately, Kenyan parliamentarians have now circumnavigated this, and they are determining their own salary. And it is also a statement of how docile our people are. The people don't get annoyed. The people don't get angry. It is your own Chinua Achebe in his book, Antils of the Savannah, who said, that he does not know from what deep wells of patience the African draws, that he is constantly abused by people he calls leaders, they call leaders, and they do nothing about it. 
And until the day that the African population is angry about that, these things, and not just angry, but they do something about it in the manner that we have seen in the Arab world. The Arabs are capable of getting angry in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Sudan, and they remain in the streets for days on end. In the sub-Saharan African, we don't. We just lament in our little rooms and recoil into our little ethnic cocoons, and we let so-called leaders run roughshod over us, and we complain and pray that God will come with fire and brimstone to salvage us. Yet God has given us the ability to rise up and demand that which is good and right. Until we do that, we are going nowhere. We can talk about institutions, but institutions must be strengthened by men. Democracy survives on the vigilance of the population. Democracy does not exist in a vacuum. If the people are not vigilant, democracy will atrophy. Another question I have is the correlation between tribalism and the virility and strength of institutions. It looks as though over the years in Africa, tribalism has been playing a game of Russian roulette with the strength of institutions. I'll give you an instance. The tribal interplay in Uganda, the kingdom of Buganda, and the first president of Uganda, not agreeing led to the likes of Idi Amin Dada to come into power. We still have that in Nigeria, tackling the institution of government. We have the Christian South, Muslim North. We have the seeding systems based on tribe. What would you like to say about this nativist culture? Let me put this in context. Part of the African problem is that uh, we are defined by others. If you look at the definition that you've given, for example, uh, the Muslim North and uh, the Christian South, is it true that that is a correct definition of what Nigeria is? If you look at the conflict in Central African Republic, which is said to be a Christian Muslim, conflict. Is it true that it is a Christian Muslim conflict? If you go to the Cameroons, we are told that it is a conflict between the English speaking and the French speaking. Is it English speaking and French speaking or there are other nuances that must be brought into play? Remember I said at the outset that the African states that we have today are artificial. Here in Nigeria, I believe that there are over 300 languages being spoken, and therefore there are over 300 tribes, each of which before the advent of colonization had their own systems of governance. So that if you go to the Yoruba land, the Oni of Ife has an influence amongst the Yoruba. If you go to Edo, you have their own governance systems. If you go to Igbo, they have their own Oba. And I'm quite sure that if you go to Benue, you'll have the Tev, you have the Bibio, you'll have the Ijo. If you go to Ethiopia, you have the Amhara, you have the Oromo, you have all, you have the Tigre. And all these have their own systems of government. And you've talked about Uganda, the Banyoro, the Basoga, the Baganda, the Banyankole. They have their own systems of governance. The question is, can these traditional systems of government subsist with the European model of governance that we inherited? In my view, the answer is yes. There is no reason why they cannot. And that is why the tradition of chieftaincies in different countries can be accommodated within a constitutional context. Let me just uh, remi remind myself and share with you a conversation that I shared with the former defense minister, now advisor to the president of Rwanda on defense, James Kaverebe. And he said that when they were liberating the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, during the dictatorship of Mobutu Sesseko, when the government of Mobutu collapsed, he said that only three institutions, and he used the word institutions, survived. 
The first institution that survived and was functional was the Catholic Church. The second institution was the traditional chieftaincies. And the third institution was witchcraft. Those are the only things that survived and maintained the nation that was then called Zaire and we now call the Democratic Republic of Congo. That tells you that institutional development and institutional efficacy and efficiency must be seen in a particular context. In a nutshell, therefore, I'm saying that time has come for African countries to examine what democracy means and to understand that democracy is, does not have a one-size-fits-all character. And number three, to understand that a people must define their own governance system. Somebody whom I respect told me only last day that you cannot run well in somebody else's shoes. Africa continues to run with borrowed shoes. Defining democracy like Abraham Lincoln defined it and using litmus tests that are made in Europe and America. As long as we continue to do that, Africa will not realize our potential. I'm excited you talked about Congo. Mm -hmm. You just opened a can of worms. Mm -hmm. Three institutions survived. Witchcraft, the traditionalist system, and the Catholic Church. Isn't that the reason why they say where logic ends, Congo begins? Is that not the reason why we're having the breakdown in the institution of security today in Nigeria. Because the tenement of logic is out of the window, sentiment and bigotry is the order of the day. That's why banditry pervades the nation from coast to coast. Is that not the case? But who says where logic stops? You know, part of our problem, including myself, is that many of the things we say, we say in English, which is a foreign tongue. Many of the things that we say, we say in French, which is a foreign tongue. Suppose we were to say these things in Fulfude, or to say them in Hausa, or Yoruba, or Igbo, or Tiv, or Ijo. Would we say them in the same way? Is it not true that prior to the advent of the Europeans, the Yoruba and the Igbo, and the Fulani and the Hausa lived in one geographical space and that they, the farmer and the tiller of land lived together and that there were ways of solving disputes? Is it not a possibility that it is the modern state with this structure, the inherited European state that has generated conflict and continues to find conflict? Is it not because of this new resource, resource that has been brought by what we call the modern state that we are unable to mediate our problems? And that if, for example, there was a conflict and you are to ask the only of Ife to mediate conflicts with the Emir of Sokoto, that there would be a, a, an easier way of resolving these disputes? Is it a possibility? Have we ever explored that possibility that if there was a conflict in Benue between the Tev and the Igbo, and that if you ask the Oba and the leaders of the Tev that the dispute would be resolved? Is it not a possibility that it is our so-called modern way of resolving disputes that we are in perpetual conflict? Is it not a possibility that this perpetual conflict in Africa is also beneficial to other powers? and that we are merely pawns in a political chessboard which we do not understand, and that if I am right in that analysis, is it not time that each country must now have a meeting and understand and appreciate how do they govern themselves, borrowing from other experiences? Remember that the post-colonial African state is very young, with Ghana only being 62 years after we regained our independence, if you look at the history of countries in Europe, you know that they had wars and conflicts before they stabilized. And in our own lifetime, we have seen European nations break up in the Baltic and in the Balkans. And that therefore, we cannot write the obituary of African countries. What we need to do is to reinterrogate our institution and begin to resolve these conflicts and realize that nobody is going to resolve them other than ourselves and that if we wait for those others, they are not interested in our well-being because our well-being means that they are threatened. These are questions that I'm putting on the table because I have no 
ironclad answers, but I believe that they ought to be interrogated if we are to realize our potential as a country. There are people who would like Nigeria to be divided into several countries. There are people who would like Ethiopia to be divided into several countries. There are people who would love Congo to be divided into several countries. There are people who would like Cote d'Ivoire to be divided into two. There are people who would like Mali and Mauritania to be divided. And if they are divided, then they can harvest the uranium and other things. How do we shield ourselves against those machinations and then those who, against those who are choreographing the dismemberment of Africa? It is by looking inwards and beginning to do things that are in our best interest. And one of the ways of doing this is recognizing traditional methods of doing things and improving them in a manner that will make them work in this day and age. A man you admire so much, mm -hmm. Thomas Isodore Newell Sankar, mm -hmm. said something very profound. Mm -hmm. He said, we must dare to invent the future. Yes. How can we dare to invent the future when one of the biggest institutions that have been an offshoot of the tribal calisthenics and intellectual rigma role all over mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. has become the institution of poverty? In Nigeria, close to 100 million people are card-carrying members of that institution. All over Africa, more than half a billion people are card-carrying members of that institution. Too many natural resources, too much poverty. How do you dare to invent the future? Thomas Sankara said, and I agree with him, that in order to bring change, sometimes you must do things which when people look at, think you are mad. And he did things within a period of five years that were monumental. First he said, why are we called Upper Volta? Shouldn't we be called a different name? Let us rename our country. And he called it Burkina Faso, the land of the upright men. And he said, one of the things that we must do is to feed ourselves. And within a short time, Burkina Faso started becoming food sufficient. And we also saw that not only with Thomas Sankara, but we also saw that in Malawi when President Bingua Mutarika became the, the president. He said, Malawi can feed ourselves. So one of the things that we must do, and Africa has no shortage of resources, Africa must begin to do things that will move us in the direction of liberating the majority of our people from sorrow and want, and this can be done. If you travel the, across the country, your country, Nigeria, you, Nigeria can feed herself. Nigeria can produce enough poultry to feed and export. Nigeria can produce sufficient rice. Nigeria can produce everything so that Nigeria need not rely 95 or 85 percent on oil, but only 5 percent. And that is true across the continent. And I believe that that realization is beginning to dawn on many countries. Look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. It can feed herself and feed the continent. Look at uh, countries such as Ethiopia can feed herself and the continent. Look at Uganda, feed herself and the continent. Look at what the Libyans were doing with the aquifers in the desert during the president of Muammar al-Gaddafi. In other words, I believe that as long as the majority of the Africans are under the clutches of poverty, even democracy is under threat. Because democracy demands that people have been liberated from the basic needs and wants and they are capable of making decisions not on the basis of salt and sugar that are doled out by political competitors, but on the basis of ideas that are put on the table for purpose of scrutiny, and then decisions are made on the basis of which is the most efficacious. I agree with you totally that poverty is something that undermines Africa and undermines her uh, in a fundamental way. I was at a private session with the Babylon Billionaires Prime Minister Yuwa. And while he was having a mentoring session, he said something very profound. He said, You always talk to life of Thomas and mm -hmm. And they'll say, Strife, you people should travel. Africans don't travel around their continent. Africans don't know their fellow Africans. We are so quick to go to London, then we're so quick to go to Mombasa. And this, leads me to the Africa trade. 
We all thought that Africans would jump on the bandwagon of the African free trade agreement because it was the right thing for us to do. But the giants of Africa, like Nigeria, took a long time to sign. Can you just answer this in, in, in a minute as we wrap up? The African yeah. trade, the free trade area, is an idea which has come late. It ought to have come in 1963. And I, have, I hold the view that although there are those who are hesitating, uh, they, are, they will come on board. And uh, in this day and age, you don't just sign on the dotted line. You've got to examine and interrogate what you are signing. And I prefer people who interrogate what they are signing rather than those who are quick to just mm -hmm. sign and then they don't do anything that is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So the mere fact that only 22 countries have signed the SETF is not in itself a bad thing. I hold the view that in the next few years, mm -hmm. giants such as Nigeria and indeed all the 54 African, 55 African countries would have signed and will begin to give meaning to intra-African trade by ensuring that we have infrastructure or the uh, trade uh, uh, tariff and non-tariff okay. barriers will be eliminated and free movement of people also in addition. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm. So I'd like to say a very big thank you. It's been a very explosive and wonderful mm. conversation with you, Prof. Once again, I, I really appreciate you for your time. Uh, we're going over now back to the live studios uh, at Rise News right here in Ikoyi. Uh, we'll be right back. Thank you once again, Prof. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rufai Osene. Quite an interesting conversation. It really was. Professor Lumumba never disappoints. Uh, he's one of the most sought-after public intellectuals in Africa, an author, you know, and uh, quite an orator. Extremely articulate and an impressive intellectual. And I like the point he made about leadership in Africa, also about the role of uh, the people themselves, you know, the people uh, having the capacity to stand up people not being docile. That, again, is very uh, important. Although he didn't refer to the example of Sudan, you know, he mentioned only the Arab Spring. <laughs>